Earth. Test out the lunar module. Uh, but uh, towards the uh, end of 1968, or actually about the summer of 68, uh, Grumman Aircraft building the uh, lunar module admitted that they could never get it ready by a flight in 1968. And uh, so another thing happened. We had intelligence information at that time that the Russians were going to put a man or two men <coughs> on a <coughs> circumnavigating flight around the moon. They were serious about it. This was not uh, something that we heard. They were actually planning to put two men around the moon because they knew, of course, our, our program was quite open. And so they were, uh, and, and they were going to try to leapfrog and, and beat us. They put a, a proton booster, that a booster big enough and strong enough to send a, a spacecraft <coughs> called Zon, Z-O-N-D, around the moon with animals, small, uh, small animals, in I think the early fall of 68. Uh, the spacecraft went around the moon, came back to the Earth, but in its approach through the atmosphere, which has to be, because of the velocity coming back, has to be very careful and very uh, accurate, uh, they were not that good in their navigation, and when they picked up the spacecraft in the Pacific, the animals had died. But they were very concerned people. They weren't going to put people up into space until they could prove that they would bring them back alive. So they sent Zon 6 up later on in the fall. And this spacecraft came back, landed in the Pacific, and uh, to better results, and they were planning now to figure out, well, should we send another one up before we put in, uh, uh, and Leonov uh, was going to be the guy that was going to go, uh, and uh, they said, well, they hesitated. In the meantime, due to the great leadership here in this country, with uh, no lunar module, a command module, that if Apollo uh, 7 would go around the Earth and prove to be a good vehicle, we would then send, a, that was in November, we will then send Apollo 8 to the moon. <coughs> 7 was successful. I changed my whole plans. I finally found myself at MIT learning the new navigation. This is not going around the Earth, but we had to go that 240,000 miles. <coughs> and <coughs> As you all know, it was a very successful flight. <laughs> I will mention more about that in my response tonight, if I can. But uh, that uh, that flight was probably the high point of uh, my space career. Apollo 13 was, of course, the, the, uh, the, the, the most challenging. Uh, but being the first out to the moon, uh, it really changed my thoughts about everything. Yeah, just I mean, you can say more about it later. But what was what was that like seeing as you were going to the moon, looking back and seeing Earth? The first people ever see that scene. Yeah. <coughs> well, the Earth was entirely different and a uh, lot smaller. Uh, I, I looked at it, you know, and thought to myself, my gosh, you know, all my friends and everybody. I, that's where I live. You know, my family's down there. Uh, it's a little blue and white ball. Uh, the uh, Earthwise pictures that you've all seen, it was taken with a telescopic lens, so I mean that uh, it's a, it looks bigger on the, on the photograph than it really is. And uh, so we, uh, we, we thought that uh, that was uh, really uh, a unique experience to do that. The, the moon itself, we were looking at the moon, uh, and I'll, I'll mention something that uh, uh, I'm kind of proud of. During our uh, uh, training for the Apollo 8, we had uh, 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 photographs of the lunar surface, of course. And as we looked at what our trajectory was going to be like going around the moon, because <coughs> we were looking at landing in the Sea of Tranquility for the landing flight, and we want, wanted to do the same type of course trajectory. Uh, there was a little triangular mountain on the near side of the moon, uh, on the shore of the, tree of, of the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, and it was a little triangle mountain that pointed directly to where we thought and what actually happened, where Apollo 11 would land. So during the training, I decided to name that little mountain, Mount Merrill, after 
and my wife, naturally. <laughs> and uh, one of the, you know, good friends at home, I did. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was brought Maryland, and in, in a, unofficially, and uh, on Apollo 8, we went around, and, and sure enough, we passed Mount Maryland, and we talked about it going out. Then on Apollo 10, which was the flight that went to the moon, and his program was to start the descent, then do a, uh, an abort. That was part of the regular program. They uh, used Mount Maryland, took a picture of it, and everything was fine. And on Apollo 11, uh, Neil Armstrong used Mount, uh, Mount Maryland as the initial point for starting the descent into the Sea of Tranquility. <coughs> Mount Maryland got a, a life of its own. <laughs> it was in books, it was in the movie. Uh, you can Google it if you want to. In July of 27th of last year. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Uh, no, July 27th, uh, yes, of last year, the International Astronomical Union officially Name that little triangle mountain, <laughs> Mount Merrill. <Yeah. laughs> so, although it has a name of its own now, but uh, to, to my wife, it will be there now and in perpetuity, I guess. <laughs> wow. <laughs>
uh, and they were used, the heaters were used occasionally during the flight to boil off a little liquid oxygen to feed the spacecraft itself for its various things. Uh, were protected by thermostats that were capable of handling 28 volt power. Around 1965, NASA or the manufacturer, I don't know which, <clears throat> told the manufacturer of the liquid oxygen tanks to replace those uh, thermostats with thermostats that were capable of handling 65 volt power because at the Cape there was a availability of 65 volt power so they just wanted to check one thing in the spacecraft and not turn up the spacecraft's power system they could plug it in and, and use it. <clears throat> The manufacturer never complied with the directive. Worse still, NASA never checked that the directive was completed. Two weeks before the flight, we did what was known as a countdown demonstration test. The spacecraft is all set to go. It's standing on the uh, sitting on top of the, of course, the Saturn V booster. Booster's not fueled at all. But in the spacecraft, everything is fuel, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, everything that had to go. The crew gets into the spacecraft. The launch crew gets into their consoles. And we count down the time all the way to zero to make sure that everything in the spacecraft functions at the proper time. Power comes off, internal power, uh, you know, the uh, navigation system comes, oxygen starts to flow into the system. Test was a complete success. After the test, the ground crew went to the spacecraft and started to secure the spacecraft. One of their jobs was to remove the liquid oxygen from the two tanks. And when they tried to remove the liquid oxygen from the damaged tank, it didn't come out. Then they thought a while, well, why don't we put the 65 volt ground power that we have and boil the oxygen out. It worked fine for everything. It will just let, it, let the heater system boil the oxygen out. They did. What they didn't know was the fact that when the temperature inside that liquid oxygen tank, now you know liquid oxygen is about 200 and some odd degrees below zero, but when it got up to 80 degrees in that one certain spot on the top of it, the little points on the thermostat started to open up to shut off the power and protect it. But it was 65 volt power, not 28 volt power, and the little contacts were welded shut. We know now from tests after the flight that the temperature got up to around four or 500 degrees Fahrenheit inside that tank. Wow. It's amazing that the tank never burst. Wow. Nothing happened. The oxygen was removed quite rapidly, they thought, uh, and, but it damaged the inside of the tank, exposed all the wires, and, and damaged the heater system completely, but no one was concerned because there was nothing to show that there was anything wrong. The day before the launch, we filled up the tank with liquid oxygen, and it was a bomb waiting to go off, and that's how it all started. So that's, that's the background. From there, you get into the lifeboat situation, just trying to get home. From there, um, what was that like? Those 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 moments, trying to those days, trying to get back. Well, we didn't we didn't get in the spacecraft when we found out four days before the launch that our entire crew had been exposed to the measles. I told you about bad omens. Uh, the doctors looked at our medical records and found out that Fred Hayes and I, having measles as kids. And our kids have the measles too. We were immune to the disease. Ken Manley was a bachelor. Never had any kids with measles, never had the measles himself. So he was dropped and Jack Swanker was put on board. That was the beginning of it. That, that was the second omen. But we launched on April 11th, 1970 at 13.13 Central Standard Time. <laughs> you, you see a scenario? <laughs> we took off on that big Saturn V. 
Uh, the first stage, of course, worked perfectly. When its fuel was expended, we dropped it. We lit the five engines on the second stage of the Saturn V. <coughs> Two minutes and 13 seconds before it should have, the center engine shut down. Do we have a crisis? What's wrong? Do we have enough fuel to keep going? To give Mission Control a lot of credit, they quickly looked at the situation, looked at the, the remaining thrust we had on the second stage and the fuel and the thrust we had on the third stage and said, yep, we can still go. And so we got into Earth orbit, checked our spacecraft, then lit the third engine the second time to get us all the way to the moon. Uh, actually uh, put us at a, uh, on the proper course and a proper speed of about 24,000 miles an hour. And we got into a long elliptical orbit all the way uh, to the moon. Uh, except on April 13th, <laughs> the night of April 13th down here, just after I finished doing a TV program, to show all the people of the world what we were doing, of which nobody, none of the networks carried, uh, the tank exploded. And from then on, it was not the third landing on the moon, but uh, one of survival. <laughs>
some areas where you're going to have to think, you know, what direction should I go to minimize the risk? Uh, you don't ask for risk. I mean, you, what you do is you set your, you, you, you set your course in a position so that you want to get the job done, whatever it's in. You, you want to build up things slowly but surely. You want to have a stable life, but then, you know, it, uh, you, but you got to do risk. Uh, to, will the job be a good one that I'm joining right now? Uh, you know, is the space program something that's going to run out of money in about three years? And here I am, you know, trying to go into a career in the Navy, and then I get stuck in this so-called space program, and, and the Navy says, well, that's too bad. You can want it to go that way, and uh, that's risk. Uh, so everything in life is is risk, and uh, uh, you just have to settle down, take a deep breath, and look at the best answer and charge from there.